Welcome to Women in the Word. My name is Vanita Jones, and it is my great honor to be here to study God's Word with you today. You know, it is a massive understatement to say that I miss seeing all of your faces. I am a people person. If you know me, you know I love people. And so being told to stay away from people has been the most difficult part of this last year for me. You know, I have a cousin that lives up in the middle of Kansas on a big old farm, and uh, his name is Richard. His nearest grocery store is 50 miles away. His nearest neighbor is about five, 10 miles away. And back in April, I called him and I wanted to talk to Richard. And I said, how are you doing? How are you handling all this craziness? And this is what he said to me. He said, you know, Vanita, he said, I've been training for this moment my entire life. He says, I'm supposed to stay away from people. And apparently they're supposed to stay away from me. And I'm in a really good place right now. Needless to say, Richard and I are nothing alike. We may be first cousins, but we are genetically polar opposites. I miss seeing people. Now, but thank the Lord we have modern technology that we can still study God's word together. I mean, nothing stops God's word. It, nothing stops it from moving and changing hearts, changing lives. First Peter 1 tells us all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. God has proven that to us over and over in this last year. Now this week, we unpack John 6, which opens with one of Jesus's big miracles. It's the feeding of the 5,000. We've all heard of this. This miracle was of such great magnitude that it's listed in all four of the gospels, all four of them. You know, what I'm thinking is interesting to note that John 6 is also where we have the first of the seven I am statements that Jesus makes. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. You know, I don't think it's any accident at all that that is recorded shortly after he feeds 5,000 plus people with five loaves of bread and two fish. Something tells me that Jesus was, knew exactly what he was doing. Open your Bibles up to John 6 if you haven't already done so. Follow along as I read uh, the first 15 verses. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs of what he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, well, 200 denarii is worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get uh, just a little. One, for, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother said, there's a, little boy, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those around who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments with the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come, save in, in, come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Okay, it's believed that about five or six months have passed since the, the end of John 5. And, and John doesn't really record why Jesus had moved to the other, sea, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. If we're sp speculating though, you know, during those five months, maybe... If you look at John 5, you see all these red letters. You know that he was having to do, Jesus was doing mental gymnastics with these religious leaders over truths that he had been saying. And it's no stretch to think that he might have just needed a little break at this point. And John records that this large crowd had followed Jesus because they had witnessed those miracles. And I think, when I think about that crowd, I think of all the people in that crowd. I would think there were people in that crowd who witnessed those miracles and they believed that Jesus was exactly who he claimed to be. 
I think there were some in that crowd that witnessed those miracles and they had a family member or they themselves needed to be healed and, and they were seeking Jesus for what they could get from him, not so much for who he was. Maybe some had witnessed those miracles and a small seed had been planted and they just wanted a little more. They were very curious. And it's quite possible that some in that crowd were only there to gather more evidence against Jesus. Because we learned back in John 5 that the religious leaders were wanting to, to find Jesus to kill him. So we find Jesus on a mountain by the Sea of Galilee with his disciples. And John records in verse 4 that the time of the Passover feast was close at hand. That tells us this crowd was very, very big. And that would be because there were so many people that had traveled there to celebrate the Passover. They would have most likely have heard about this man named Jesus doing these miracles and they wanted to see him for himself, themselves. And as Jesus looks out at this crowd, this, this huge crowd of people, he sees their need. He sees they're hungry. He sees their physical need, but he also more importantly saw their spiritual needs. He knew they needed spiritual food. Now this crowd of 5,000 mentioned would have been the number of men in the crowd. So uh, each man would have represented a family most likely. He probably had his wife and children with him. There's many that speculate this crowd could have been 10, 15,000 in number. It would have been huge. You know, I read something written by John MacArthur about the miracles of Jesus. And I thought it was really interesting. I've never thought of it this way. Throughout his ministry, MacArthur said, Jesus could have thrilled watching crowds with spectacular displays of, of divine power, such as lifting up the, the temple and, and suspending in the midair. He could have flown across the sky like, like Superman. He could do that. He could have done all these miracles that said, look at me, look how powerful I am. But instead, MacArthur says he chose to display not only his divine power, but also his divine compassion by doing miracles that helped individuals in need. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He fed the hungry. He, he cast out demons, all things that were needs of all these individuals. And now we see him meeting the needs of this hungry crowd, not only feeding them, but also he's allowing his apostles the guy's following and working with him to participate in this miracle. Something tells me that this miracle was as much about those apostles growing in their faith as it was about feeding the bellies of this hungry crowd. We know this because we see something recorded in, in verses five and six. It says, lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that we can feed these people? And John doesn't make us guess. He tells us why Jesus said this. He said to test him. He's testing them for he knew what he was going to do. Now the responses from these apostles, I thought were very familiar. They're all responses that I have, have said or had when I see a task that seems impossible. When I'm faced with impossible tasks, I have done every one of these. First, they avoid the problem completely. Now, we don't see this in John per se, but in the other accounts, in, in Matthew, in his account of the 5,000 being fed, he says a little bit more about this. Look at Matthew 14 on your verse sheet. It says, now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to the villages buy, and they buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. See, they first suggested just send them away. Just get rid of this problem. We don't need to deal with this. Secondly, I do this all the time. I look at the facts in front of me and I go, oh, it's impossible. We can't do this. That's what Philip did. Philip did the math. And when he did the math, he figured out it was gonna take the equivalent of 200 days wages to give each person just a little bite of food. So what did he say? Can't do this. Send them away. Thirdly, a lot of times I have the solution to the problem right in front of me, but it doesn't seem that great of a solution. But I fail to make the connection with what I have with what Jesus is able to do with what I have. And that's what we see with Andrew. 
But prompted by Jesus, Andrew brought those five barley loaves and two small fish. Now, the word used for these small fish in the original text actually means like sardine-sized fish. Don't, don't think like record-setting bass fish. We're talking two small sardine-sized fish. And they looked at that and he said, it's all I've got. I just don't think it's enough. I say it all the time. I, I, I discount what Jesus can do with what I have. Now, the fourth response, of course, was from Jesus himself. And, and I can say, I, I rarely have this response. When we look at all the gospels put together, we're able to see that Jesus gives us this beautiful example of what to do when we're faced with a seemingly impossible situation. He took what they had, it was meager. He gave thanks first to his heavenly father for what he had, and then he trusted his heavenly father to, to multiply it for him. And we know that he did that because then he showed the disciples how to act on that faith that he had, and he told them, have the crowd set down. And they began to hand out food. And I can only imagine what it was like then. You know, the disciples' faith may have been failing while they were trying to solve the problem, but their obedience didn't fail. They jumped in and helped. As I studied this portion of John 6, I often wondered, was that a joyful obedience? Or do you think it was kind of a doubtful, laced with complaining type of obedience? Something that's very familiar to me. You know, those around us are always watching. They're not only watching if we're going to act on our faith, they're also watching how we're going to act on our faith. Look at Philippians 2.14 on your verse sheet. It says, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. You know, I suspect that that grumbling or doubting, if they were grumbling and doubting when they started, I would have bet it quickly changed to this joyful excitement as they began to realize they're assisting Jesus with a huge miracle. How exciting could this be? And if not during the time they handed out that food, I guarantee you they were joyfully excited and excited when they obediently gathered those 12 baskets of food. The 12 baskets of leftovers. They started with five barley loaves and two sardine-sized fish, and now they have 12 baskets of food, enough to meet the needs of 12 apostles. No coincidence. Jesus, the bread of life, not only fed their physical needs with bread and fish, he also fed their spiritual needs as he gave them an opportunity to grow in their faith. And he's about to give them another opportunity that's not just gonna grow their faith, it's gonna solidify their faith. Follow along as I read the next six verses, starting with uh, verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a, storm went, a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. They were frightened, but he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him in the boat and immediately the boat was on at the land to which they were going. Verse 16 says that the di disciples decided to leave but Matthew and Mark add a little bit more to this information. Look at Matthew 14 on your verse sheet. It says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. The disciples may have decided to get in the boat, but they were compelled by Jesus to do it. John doesn't record the reason John, Jesus compelled them to do it, but... Some have speculated that Jesus maybe was keeping them safe. Maybe he felt like they could be arrested, could be arrested or maybe they were worried, he was worried this fanatical crowd was gonna, gonna sweep them up in their, in, with their excitement and their emotion. But you know, I wonder if he wasn't also just saving them from themselves. If you think about it, they had just witnessed this huge miracle. 
This is a big one. And they not only witnessed it, they participated in it. Can you imagine the excitement they're feeling? And, and I wonder if they couldn't have easily been become prideful, kind of got swept up in that emotion of that fanatical crowd. And then, then what would happen? You know, they'd, the crowd would sweep them in and they'd be like somebody there. Because guess what? They'd been with Jesus. Yeah, I know Jesus. We, we travel a lot together. I've been, I eat dinner with him all the time. They're like the mayor of Hoosville. They would have been somebody with this crowd. They so easily could have just kept up with this crowd, experiencing a great high. I think he sent them out in the storm to avoid an even bigger storm. And in the words of Warren Wearsby, he says the feeding of the 5,000 was the lesson and that the storm was the examination after the lesson. And I tend to agree with Wearsby. I think he's onto something. Now, in true John fashion, where he's just kind of the facts, ma'am, or just the facts that point me to Jesus, he doesn't record another piece of information that I think is kind of important. Matthew records it. He doesn't, he doesn't record that Peter also walked on water. It was only a couple steps, but Peter actually got out of that boat. I don't think it's because John forgot that fact. But in true John fashion, I think he sticks to the facts that point us to Jesus. But I can guarantee you, Peter never forgot walking on the water towards his Lord. And I bet when he told that story for years after that, he never left that fact out. I have no doubt that the faith of each of those apostles grew by leaps and bounds. That stormy night in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, where the bread of life performed so many miracles, but three really amazing ones. First, he walked on water. It's huge. Second, he calmed the storm. And, and third, there's one in verse 22 that, or 21 that so many times I have skimmed right over, but it says, then immediately the boat was on the shore. Three big, big miracles. Jesus had been teaching his apostles what to do and how to do it. Not only teaching them, he just showed them what to do and how to do it. The dilemma of feeding that 5,000 was the hands-on part of that learning, and now he's gonna give them the examination. You know, he's so willing and so able to meet our physical and spiritual needs. You know, in the early verses of chapter six, Jesus met their basic physical needs to all that crowd around them, but his apostles as well. But I think he did it so he could show them that he could also meet their spiritual needs. When you trust Jesus, the bread of life, to meet your physical needs, he feeds your faith as well. And then he leads you into an even stronger and a deeper relationship with him. As you watch him day in and day out meet your needs, big needs, small needs, whatever they are, you're going to trust him more and more and you're just gonna fall more and more in love with him. You can take that to the bank. Let's pick up at verse 22 and follow along. I'm gonna read to verse 50. It says, on the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came down the, da, near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went into Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. Do not work of the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him, him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it's written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but 
my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never thirst and whoever uh, never hunger, but whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should not lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my father, that whoever looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he say, now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the father except he who is from God. He has seen the father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has, has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Okay, so the next day, the day after that storm on the Sea of Galilee, we've got this crowd with a, with a mystery on their hands. And, you know, they look up and they see that Jesus is gone. And they know that he didn't get in that boat with those disciples because he dismissed the crowd. So this, he, they knew the disciples went off without him. So how did he get across the water? So I just imagine this huge crowd of like Columbos, you know, they've got their, their pad and their pencil and they're taking down notes and trying to figure out how did Jesus get to the other side? Now, John doesn't record why they went searching for Jesus other than to find out when he got there and how he got there. Maybe they were hungry. I don't know, maybe they still wanted to force him to be their earthly king. They were being oppressed by the Romans. We, but I bet when they did find him, they did not expect to get the sermon they got from him. See, when they found Jesus, they simply asked, Rabbi, when and how did you get here? And Jesus being who he is, he saw right through their question. He used this opportunity to teach them a new spiritual truth. He knew that they were way more interested in filling their bellies with food than actually filling themselves with, with truth that he would give them. They were seeking to fill their, fill their bellies. They were looking for what they could get from Jesus, not for Jesus himself. They were, but Jesus knew this, they were there and it was an opportunity to teach them. So he did. He points out there are two kinds of food. He said, there's physical food, it fills your body, but it's only temporary. Then he says there's spiritual food that feeds and it sustains your soul. And in verse 27, that crowd misinterprets what Jesus is saying. He's talking about working. He says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for, for food that endures for eternal life. They eagerly reply with, what must we be doing to be doing the work of God? And I bet they didn't expect to hear what he said. To paraphrase it, Jesus says, that all the work they needed to do is to believe in the one that had been sent to them by God, namely Jesus. All they had to do was believe. Now, if this crowd hasn't already started to annoy you, now I may love people, I don't like crowds. And, and this crowd would have really driven me crazy. They already are and I wasn't even there. But surely verse 30 is gonna annoy you, seriously. This crowd has witnessed Jesus' greatest miracle and they still want more evidence that he says he is who he says he is. But that was then and this is now. And they wanted more miracles. They wanted more miracles before they were gonna believe and, which is completely backwards to the divine order of, of believing and then seeing. Look at John 11 on your uh, 40 on your verse sheet. John, Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? And then look at Hebrews 11, one. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. Okay, so in their defense, this crowd that's annoying me, 
they probably were just demanding more for Jesus' credentials because he had claimed his deity back in verse 29. And they felt like they needed more evidence to, to, to know that exactly he was who he claimed to be. A little more information that might help us with this is they would have been brought up being taught by their ancestors and the rabbis and the religious leaders that uh, God, that God sent, he- sent from heaven manna back in the wilderness. And so they taught them that the Messiah, when they, he came, he would also be able to duplicate the miracle of manna. And that's what they're expecting. It's the miracle of manna found back in Exodus 16. They may have witnessed Jesus feeding 5,000 plus people, but they had heard that Moses had made it rain bread from heaven for the entire nation of Israel for 40 years. That's a big old miracle. So they're saying, if you're really who you say you are, if you're the one sent by God, the one that's supposed to be even greater than Moses, then prove it. Prove it by raining manna, rain bread from heaven. I don't know how he didn't just get so annoyed with this crowd. You know, I'm thinking Jesus is facing this really tough crowd. I look at this and I think, oh my goodness, they, they have to be driving him crazy. But you know, I don't think that's what he thought at all. Jesus is thinking, you just teed up the ball, you've given me the driver, and I'm going to crush it right now. And he, he goes into verse 32, and he says, he says, truly, truly. That's Jesus' way of saying, listen up. I'm about to tell you a spiritual truth. In fact, he says that very thing, truly, truly, three more times in John 6. So to say that John 6 is loaded with the spiritual truth is, is an understatement. And in verse 32 and 33, Jesus states two major truths. He says, it was God the Father, not Moses, that gave those Israelites the bread from heaven. Look at Exodus 16, 4 in your verse sheet. Then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And then he goes on to say, the father is still giving the manna, but the manna is different than the manna of the past. That was not the true bread from heaven. See, when Jesus says, my father now gives true bread out of heaven, it's, it's using the word gives, which is present tense. And that indicates that the true bread was not that manna of the past, but the bread the father was currently giving. The manna in the past, though it was bread supplied by God, it was merely a foreshadow of the true bread which comes down from heaven, namely Jesus. Now look at John 3, 13 on your verse sheet. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. See, the crowd's response to these profound truths reveal that they're still looking to fill their bellies, not fuel their beliefs. They want it, they're looking to get what they can from Jesus. About now I can imagine that Jesus was wishing he had made a PowerPoint presentation because I don't think these guys are getting it. And in verse 35, to clear things up, Jesus makes the first of his major, his seven I am statements. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I don't think he could have made it any clearer to them. He's trying to tell them that the bread he's speaking of is not food. It's not food. It's a person. It's him. And although physical bread is quite satisfying, that satisfaction is only temporary. But once someone has a right relationship with Jesus, the true bread of life, they find eternal satisfaction. Now, I know there may be a collective gasp when I say this, but in our Western culture, bread is optional. It's optional at meals. We don't always have bread at our meals. Sometimes we do. During that time when Jesus was walked on earth, it was essential. Bread was a major part of their meal. In fact, it would be considered a staple. So by Jesus declaring that he is the bread of life, he's saying, I'm essential. I'm man's necessary food. I am your staple. 
And what follows in verses 37 through 40 have been called some of the most profound words that Jesus has ever spoken. And in a nutshell, we could have spent weeks on these three verses, four verses. In a nutshell, verse 37 tells us that the Father works sovereignly in people's lives. And the Father enables people to come to Jesus and anyone who is enabled by the Father and they go to Jesus for salvation, they will not be turned away. Jesus states that he came from heaven to do the Father's will. And the Father's will is this, that whoever looks to Jesus and believes will receive eternal life. Now, Jesus had made his way to the synagogue by this point, And so there would have been several religious leaders in this group listening. And Jesus's I am statement caused quite a stir. You can imagine. So, so much so that they started grumbling amongst themselves about it. They grumbled because they knew Jesus made this I am statement. He was claiming to be God when he did it they would have been remembering God, that God revealed himself to Moses by that same name, I am. Look at Exodus three fourteen on your verse sheet. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. They knew that Jesus was, cl- what he was claiming and they didn't like it. Because guess what? Jesus didn't fit their narrative. He was claiming that he was sent from heaven by his father and they saw him as a mere human born to human parents from that despised town in Nazareth, not exactly what they were expecting with their Messiah. Jesus told them to stop grumbling among themselves and he proceeded to restate his case. Verses 57 through, or 47 through 50 could be called the summary statement of all the above verses. And here it is in a summary that I put together. The Father sent His Son from heaven to earth, and anyone who places their trust in His Son will have eternal life. His Son, the bread of life, unlike physical bread, is the only, that only satisfies us temporarily, is able to satisfy eternally, forever. That satisfaction is not only revealed on the other side when we're of eternity, when we're in heaven, It's available available right now to us. It's a satisfaction while we live in this world filled with things that promise to fulfill all of our cravings and, and, and to make us feel better with whatever it is materially here. We have someone who is more than able to fulfill all those cravings. Place your trust in Jesus, the bread of life, who is able to eternally satisfy all your cravings. All your cravings. Now, Jesus is about to make another statement that causes the religious leaders to grumble yet again. Let's finish up. I want to read to the end of John. Let's start at verse 51. It says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. And then go down to 59. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Capernaum. Now, many of his disciples heard it. They said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense to this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Is it the Spirit who gives life? The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and, he, and who it was who had be, would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it's granted by his father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. But Jesus said to the 12, do you wanna go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, "Did did I not choose you, the 12? and yet one of you is a devil. 
He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the 12, was going to betray him. So we find Jesus making this very bold statement in verse 53, one that he states like six more times. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And we know it's spiritual truth because he starts it with truly, truly. He says, listen up. He repeats it six more times. And he's saying that he alone is going to be the sacrifice that would save us from our sins. Save us from our sins. He would save us in this world. It's interesting that this whole discourse, though, to me, involves food. I mean, think about it. It started way back at the very beginning of John 6, talking about food. And all the way to the end, he's talking about food. MacArthur, John MacArthur suggests that the use of anal- this analogy of food has four major parallels to spiritual truth. And I thought it was really interesting. First, he said, food is of no use if it's not eaten. If you make food and leave it on your table, it's of no use. Likewise, he says, knowing truth without acting on it is of no use. Secondly, he says, eating is prompted by hunger. Those who are not hungry are not interested in food. In the same way, a sinner who is satisfied in their sin is not hungry for God's truth. Thirdly, he says, food involves trust. He said, you wouldn't knowingly eat spoiled or tainted poison food. That very act of taking a bite of food and putting it in your mouth implies that you trust that that food is safe and you think it's okay to put it into your body. So using the metaphor of eating the bread of life implies that you trust what it is enough to put it into you, to believe in it. Fourth, eating is personal. There's no such thing as eating by proxy. You can't eat a a, a meal for someone else and expect them to reap the benefits of that food. Likewise, salvation is not by proxy. Every individual has to make that choice on their own. You can't do it for them. I mean, don't you wish that you could do that? Don't you wish that your friends and family would gobble up the bread of life as quickly and easily as they do on Thanksgiving Day at lunch? Wouldn't that be wonderful? But I think you get the picture of what he's saying when he repeats this over and over. You have to eat my body and drink my blood. He's saying eating the body of Jesus implies believing in Jesus, believing what Jesus has done and trusting it. So basically, when you say you eat his flesh, drink his blood, it's to be saved. He's saying, you believe in what I did on the cross and you believe that I rose from the dead. You believe everything I've said. Now, what he's not talking about is that the sacrament of Holy Communion. And we know this because there, there was no such thing as sacrament of Holy Communion at that point. That came at, right before his crucifixion. And secondly, Partaking in the Holy Communion does not give you uh, eternal life. And this specifically says, when you eat his body, drink his blood, you will have eternal life. Now, in verse 60, we find out that this truth, the last truth has now caused even the 12 disciples to kind of of grumble just a little bit. They're, They're starting to understand, but I don't think they can understand it completely. And they're finding it hard to accept, which is understandable. I mean, We're looking at hindsight. They're trying to figure out what he's saying then. The Jewish leaders, on the other hand, are starting to understand what he's saying, and they're just rejecting it. They're rejecting it, and they're turning away from him and leaving. They'd stumbled over the truth that Jesus came down from heaven. They stumbled over the fact that they had to eat his flesh and drink his blood to be saved. And Jesus Jesus says to them, if you're stumbling over all of that, your heads are going to explode when I ascend into heaven. How are you going to handle that fact? So because of their unbelief, many in that crowd, they turned away from following Jesus. They went back to their hopeless lives. They went back to their hopeless religions and left Jesus. Now, I I kind of think this had been a great time for Jesus to say, was it something I said? Because if you think about it, Jesus lost most of his crowd following him with one sermon. One sermon, one that was packed to the brim with spiritual truth, and it turned them away from him. The words, now the words, the word disciple used in verse 66 
it's referring to those in the crowd that were following him to learn from him. It's not his 12 apostles. Those disciples were simply a word to use to describe a student, someone seeking truth, seeking learning. It doesn't refer to the 12 apostles, who John records is a little bit confused, of course, but they chose to stay by Jesus' side. And then Jesus asked them if they wanted to leave as well. And don't you love Simon Peter? He's, he's just that bold guy. He just says it. He's the first to respond. And I love what he says. I think these words should be engraved on my brain and in my heart. Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. See, ba Peter is basically saying, Lord, what you're saying is difficult to understand. But, but Jesus, your words give me life. So why would I go anywhere else? And did you notice this? Peter said, we believed and then we've come to know. I don't know how he's done it, but Peter seems to understand that divine order of believing and then seeing. You know, John 6 draws to a close with, Je with Jesus, reminding those 12 apostles that he had chosen them. When he says that, he doesn't mean he's chosen them for a salvation, just that he had chosen them to serve with him. And Peter was one of his true disciples. And we know that by what he said, he's completely committed to Jesus. Can the same be said about you? Can you with confidence declare, Lord, to whom shall I go? You alone have the words of life, of eternal life. And I have believed and I have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. See, my prayer for each one of you is that you place your trust in Jesus, the bread of life, the bread of life, who alone has the words of eternal life. And if you've already done that, my prayer is that you will be completely committed to Jesus as you live out your life, bringing honor and glory to the Holy One of God. Please pray with me. Precious Father, you, um, you are so good to us. You teach us spiritual truths, Lord, that are hard, but you, you teach us truth and you give us an ability to, to hear it and to planted in our hearts. Lord, I pray that we act on what we hear from you, Lord. Lord, I pray that we trust your words, even when times are hard, even when it's hard to understand, Lord, that we would trust you, we would be obedient, and we would act on our faith, Father. Father, we thank you that you give us your word to study, and I pray that you um, bless it as we go with it into the world and share it with others. Father, we love your son, and you would love your word, and it's Jesus' name we pray. Amen.